Welcome to the NCEA On Demand session, Strategies for Navigating the Political Landscape, the Increasingly Complex Role of the Catholic School Leader. My name is Melody Wittenbach, and I'm the Executive Director of the Road Center for Catholic Education here at Boston College. And I'm Adam Default. I'm the Superintendent of Catholic Schools in the Diocese of Columbus, Ohio. So today, we're going to be talking about the connection between education and politics. Education policy has become truly central to the role of leaders in diocesan officials, and therefore a discussion of, of the growing role of diocesan offices and schools in government affairs is critical. Our presentation today is going to leave you with a few things. Number one, a deeper understanding of how legislation as written has the potential to impact Catholic schools. Number two, an understanding of the political framework that we operate in. And number three, strategies for navigating politics, including the enhanced awareness of this new dimension of Catholic school leadership. To begin, we'll share a little bit about ourselves and our personal stories and how we began, began to see our role as political agents working within the Catholic school system. So I'll start. I um, got in interested in education and government in college. I, my undergraduate degree is in government. And I began teaching in a Catholic school after, after graduation and would often get that question, how are you using that government degree? Um, when I started as a principal, the answer would have been, not really. Politics at that time was limited to school lunches and Title I. It was assumed that since we've got limited government support, there was limited concern and limited involvement of the government in Catholic schools. Since we weren't public, there was little for them to, to do. In many states, that is true, and there is a hands-off approach to Catholic education. But when I began serving as a superintendent here in Ohio, I saw something completely different. Ohio provides a lot for non-public schools, everything from bus transportation to administrative cost reimbursement to five different uh, voucher scholarship programs, a scholarship granting organization for tax credits, being a principal in Ohio or a superintendent in Ohio means having to learn to manage these programs and the relationship that keeps questions answered and programs growing. And there's always that risk that since these are creations of the legislature, these types of programs can be taken away by the legislature. So comparing these two experiences of government leads to the conclusion that although church and state might be separate, they have a great deal of connection. And so now I certainly am using that undergraduate degree a lot more. And for myself, yeah, so I, for the past seven years, I have been working more around the formation of the leaders for our Catholic school system, both here at Boston College and at the University of Notre Dame. But prior to that, my service to Catholic schools was the first as a teacher where I was working always with kind of the marginalized students in uh, lower income schools. And then I became a principal in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where we know the first school voucher program began here in the United States. And when I was president there, um, I, our school board had not moved forward with actually the voucher program. And so I had to work and negotiate and build a coalition around why we should actually engage in the school choice program, what the financial benefits would be, how we would administer this within our Catholic school. And so our school did engage in that uh, voucher program and it continues to today to benefit from the resources that the federal government um, and state government provides, um, both at the um, title level, but then also with the vouchers. And so it really, this kind of engagement at the local level in this really helped to shift my understanding of how you know, as school leaders, we really are political agents and that we really have an opportunity to give voice to policies that really impact our ability to operate and provide an equitable education to our students and to allow families who desire that uh, choice of an education for their child, how we can really be a voice for them um, at the legislative level. And so we're gonna dive into a conversation on politics a bit more here, um, as Adam had said. And so that just gives you a little bit about our own personal backgrounds and why this has become an, uh, kind of a passionate issue for both of us. 
So I'm going to begin with kind of providing a little bit of an understanding of the political frame uh, and how we can look at our work as Catholic educators. And when we think about politics, oftentimes people are a little apprehensive, right? They don't want to dive into conversations for fear of maybe offending somebody or for bringing about a political view that might be not in alignment with someone else. And so uh, they can kind of shy away from conversations that might be somewhat um, bringing about conflict, if you will. But politics is really the realistic process of making decisions and allocating resources in a context of scarcity and with divergent interests. So I'm going to unpack this a little bit more. And this quote really comes from um, two scholars, Bullman and Deal, who look at organizational theory. And they look at it saying there are different ways that we could operate as a leader or as an individual within the context of an organization. But if we do it from a political frame, a political understanding, where we put on our glasses to say, what are politics and how are they being um, played out in a given organization, they really focus on three central elements, organizations as coalitions, power and decision making, and then finally conflict in organizations. And so I'm going to dive a little bit more deeply into these three areas that helps us understand this political frame. So first of all, organizations as coalitions. So when we think a little bit about our Catholic schools, I'm sure that you can see that there are different coalitions or different groups of individuals who kind of align with one another. This isn't uncommon. I think if you were to go into any teacher faculty lounge, you would see that there's certain people who are often together around with one another more regularly than one another. You know, people kind of form alliances within organizations, right? You have different people who often have common interests that you have, they align with you because of the values that you may have and beliefs that you uphold. And so oftentimes, when you think a little bit about how an organization operates, right, we do what we do because we believe that we can be better together, right? Better together than we are apart. And so when people form these different or coalitions or groups or kind of support networks, they can navigate different decision making in a way that, you know, where more voices and more people give voice to something, they can influence an outcome. And so they are kind of an opportunity to have some collective action Action, these groups of individuals and kind of are motivated by similar kind of um, purposes, right? Similar values, similar beliefs. So that's one thing to kind of think a little bit about, especially as we kind of broaden the context of thinking about how is our Catholic school um, in, integrated within the larger Catholic school diocese, how are we interfacing with other, you know, leaders of Catholic schools, teachers of the Catholic schools within our, you know, given area, but locally, and then expanding that out even regionally, nationally, how are we a coalition of Catholic schools, right? And then how do we even interface with others within the sector, right? So our public school counterparts, our charter school counterparts. And so I think one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that we truly are better together as a Catholic school system. Now I mentioned a little bit about decision making, but it really ultimately comes to power, right? So individuals and groups, everybody has different needs that exist. And as a Bowman and Deal quote stated, right, there are often scarce resources um, that exist in a given community and a given organization. And people are kind of vying for those resources. And we know that Catholic schools have done an exceptional job of finding a way to stretch their dollar, to utilize the resources that they have, to be able to kind of operate their school communities. And when we think a little bit about how does that kind of, um, sometimes when we are competing, right, for different resources, our interests collide. We may see some conflict that exists or that, ar that arises. And so how competing groups articulate their preferences and can mobilize power, right, kind of that group influence or an ability to kind of exercise different types of power can really drive an outcome. And power produces, power produces reality. That's one of the things that it really is very introduced, interesting to kind of give thought to. There are different types of power that exist. When you think a little bit about you yourself as an individual, be it a teacher, be it a leader, you have personal power, you have influence. You may have a reputation, right? If you're an exceptional teacher, you may have people come to you and say, oh, I've heard you're a wonderful teacher. I wanna come you know, observe you, or oh, you have great influence. You have just a strong reputation by the parents. That's a different type of power that exists within our communities. Um, individuals who have information and extra expertise, if you know something is gonna happen, you have a type of power that maybe some that doesn't know doesn't have. Um, and so there are different types of power that exist that are, in, that are important for us to be mindful of. And how that power is exercised, again, influences decision-making. Now, one thing to note is, 
Conflict isn't necessarily bad in organizations. Conflict is normal. It's inevitable. It, it exists, right? There are people who have different kind of approaches. They uh, maybe articulate things differently. And so when you are in conflict, when there is that scarce resources and you have incompatible differences, one thing that is definitely going to rise is conflict, right? And so conflict has a potential to do something really good, though. And I think if you can think a little bit about how in organizations, be it even in other industries, when we look at, you know, competing businesses that have a similar product, right? They can often challenge the status quo when they're in conflict with one another, because what they do is they have to stimulate innovation. They have to stimulate change. They have to stimulate people to think about how are we going to continue to grow and improve our practices. And so conflict in organizations can exist. And I think that we see that, and um, Adam's going to go a little bit more deeply into this, when we think a little bit about conflict in between um, kind of the public, the charter, the private sector within a school ecosystem. But again, conflict can encourage right, new ideas, and it's important to kind of give that context. It isn't always bad. We can't necessarily shy away from that. We've got to be able to approach things differently and in an innovative way. So Adam's going to talk now a little bit about a study that he did um, that kind of, kind of helped to demonstrate how this political frame is in action in the state of Ohio. Yep, thanks, Melody. So we can look at a study that I engaged in um, very recently as a case study of everything that Melody just outlined in terms of power and politics in Catholic education. And this study um, looked at the political frame of the school principal experience, particularly with the Ed Choice program here in Ohio. Ed Choice is one of the five voucher programs that serve students in our state in non-public schools. Uh, in 2019, this program served 40,000 students um, across our state. And it now provides uh, scholarships up to $5,500 for elementary schools and $7,500 for high schools. So it's significant funding for our schools. And it's controversial. In 2019, there was a legislative attempt to modify the Ed Choice program, and it resulted in days of very intense hearings at the Ohio State House. The controversy can really best be summarized by two very opposing comments. One test person who testified said, one size does not fit all when it comes to children and their education, and no one knows their child better than a parent. Vouchers provide equal opportunity to families that empowers them to select the educational path that best fits their child's needs. Another testifier said, to me, it is really simple. Ed Choice was established to take taxpayer voted money for public education and to subsidize financially strained private schools. And you can guess which person was from a Catholic school and which person was from a public school. So with that as the background and the landscape, this study took a look at what the principal experience of utilizing this program was actually like and how they navigated through the political space. There were really three key findings that I'd like to talk about with you today. And the first is the complicating role of the leader. So the Ed Choice program has, well, first we can back up and, and just define that a Catholic school principal's role is a big one. It's a very complex and complicated one. Um, studies have shown that the principal is often the chief executive officer and the chief operating officer within a school, really responsible for everything that happens under the school's roof. Other studies have said that the role has increased in complexity over time, and it truly exceeds the ability of one person to handle all tasks necessary to be a faith leader, an academic leader, a facilities manager, a staff supervisor, occasionally a nurse, a substitute teacher, and the hundreds of other things that principals do during the course of a day. With government programs and increased government involvement comes additional work. Some studies have found that participation in voucher programs um, involve pros and cons that have to be weighed out by each school before making the decision to accept vouchers. It, really is summarized by the statement that no one will give you something for nothing. There will be additional work required when a school engages in a program like this. And to do that and to manage that, principals need to figure out how they're going to address increasingly increasing complexity. In the study that we did, we interviewed eight principals and they commented on the importance of having someone help them with the demands of ed choice. One principal described having a knowledgeable designee who administers this program and who gets into the weeds of the rules of this program is the secret weapon to maximizing 
this scholarship. There was no correlation between school enrollment size and the, avail and the availability of support people for managing the program. Even the smallest school in this study had a delegated individual who managed the program's paperwork. Every study had a series of rules and procedures in place for how to address every facet and every stage of the program from the application process to working with families to actually engaging with the state and then monitoring all the rule changes that happen periodically. The impact on the budget was offset by participation in the program. So for most of the schools in our study, it was worth it. The second key area that we saw was the importance of engagement. Knowing that with any politically created, legislatively created program, there's a risk. And the risk is that it can be subject to the legislative and political process. The Ed Choice program could disappear by an act of our legislature. And that's what some of the 2019 um, hearings that I mentioned were about. Principal summarized this by saying the big question lurking is always, what would happen if this went away? What would happen if the state took it away? And many schools would be struggling. Many schools would be in a lot of trouble. And so sustainability is always in the back of principals' minds when they're working with this program. One participant um, one in our study described that their school had actually ended their participation in the program because of some of the uncertainty surrounding it. But that school is now considering reinstating it because of the potential benefits and impact that the program can have. The fact that so much funding hinges on the continued support of the governor and legislature of our state can cause concern among principals when envisioning their long-term financial plans. And so it, it, it underlines the importance of being involved. Principals have to stay aware and engaged with the political process, knowing what's happening, knowing what's going on, what are the key debates, what are the key issues, and they need to advocate. We'll talk later about some strategies for how to do that, but the importance is perfectly clear. If we're not telling our story, and advocating for our students and explaining to others why students can benefit from this and why that's a good thing for Catholic education, no one else will. The third key finding in our study was the importance of relationships. Relationships are the key to managing and maintaining participation in a program like this. That took a variety of forms. It took the shape of knowledge, Principals need to engage with individuals who know the program. Principals talked about their relationship with staff at our Department of Education, who they can go to to ask any question and get the response. One principal described their contact at our Department of Education as the unofficial liaison between the school and the program. Another principal said that they would love to say that they've spent a lot of time educating themselves in all the changes for, for Ed Choice but they haven't. They rely on other people to educate them, and they're grateful for that. There's a relationship that hinges on participation. A process like this can be overwhelming for new families. One principal said that they need to hold the hand of their families and lead them through the application process. They'll spend time with the families. They'll walk through the application, which can often be complex and can be intimidating to many families. This it reinforces the, the need to be able to explain and interpret rules and program benefits to a variety of constituents. Principals also spoke about the need to deal with pushback. There's two sets of challenges that can come from, from in this area. And one stems from other parents at a school who might feel that having students on a scholarship could be unfair to those paying full tuition. And the other side is from external sources, such as local districts, who might view the scholarship as, as taking away students or taking away funding. Principals who spoke about these concerns described them as potentially time consuming and stress inducing, but they said that the issues diminish with time because of relationship building, because principals are able to encourage buy-in and support, because pr principals are able to talk through the questions and the concerns to develop a sense of understanding. All of that takes time. All of that adds to the work that principals already do, but all of those come along with the political process. 
And here's another wonderful quote from the study, right? I see ed choice as an equalizer for our community. We are now a school that anyone can come to, know they're getting a solid Catholic education and their finances don't play a part in that decision. And that's a great quote that speaks really to the reason why principals take all of this on. It would be easy not to, but the benefits that come from this wonderful program in our state are truly remarkable. And I think that principals can build their structures and it, as long as they're comfortable engaging in the political process to make this worthwhile for families. And so we have to ask ourselves now, how should school administrators respond to political challenges? We know that your every day is very full, right? Having experienced leading schools, both Adam and I know that there are so many things that happen in a given day. And when you set out kind of what you think you're gonna achieve, you know, a student is in your office, a parent has a concern, you're working with a teacher. So your day-to-day -day is very full, but being attentive to what's happening politically is really a critical uh, skill and, and kind of responsibility that you have that will hopefully help to continue to shape the long-term sustainability of your Catholic school. So we have four points that we're gonna expand upon that we believe are key strategies for helping you navigate the political environment. First, it begins with education, right? Educating yourself and your community. It's so critical that you're aware of what's happening at the local level, what types of bills are being passed that are potentially gonna impact your school community. Um, learn who the different think tanks are in your area, in your region, nationally, state associations that exist, who the different influential people are, getting to know them, having an opportunity to kind of interface with them is really key. Every state has individuals like this. And so you as a leader have to be external facing as well and think a little bit about how do I build relationships with these individuals who have influence at that uh, legislative le level. And, and two, one thing that a number of diocesan offices have incorporated are individuals who can be that government personnel. And Adam, you have an individual in your office as well who kind of navigates some of this, if you wanna share. We definitely, we definitely do here in Columbus. To help us educate ourselves, we've created a position in our office of Catholic schools that manages and engages with government affairs. This person keeps an eye on the state house, advises schools of government issues, interprets those issues, um, keeps tabs on legislative activities, laws, government programs, and builds relationships with our state government and government officials. We brought in this person from the state house. Her previous work had been as a legislative aide for a state senator. So it was somebody who really knew the process, but also could explain those, those pieces to constituents and to schools and to families. And um, we find this role to be critically essential to our office. And secondly, engage community voices, right? So thinking most, a little bit about how you key your key stakeholders. Exactly, and most states have a Catholic conference that helps with this. For superintendents, in knowing that Catholic conference is there and engaging with them, meeting frequently and uh, understanding the issues that they're tackling is critical. And then sharing that and communicating that out to principals makes a big difference. Here in Ohio, our superintendents meet with our Catholic conference once a month. And then we um, have that good relationship where we get a, a great update on what's happening and then are able to turn around and give talking points and, and explanations to the principals that need to know. For principals, they need to be aware of the ed major education related issues in their state and to then share information out to their community we can work with the Catholic Conference to lobby. We can do things like hosting legislative visits at our schools. We can have parents communicate with the legislators, remembering that parents are the ones the legislators want to hear from. They're the voters. And legislators are, are there as an act of voters. They need to engage with and continue to communicate with the people they represent. Your parents have power because they are voters. And while we want to avoid advocating for a particular candidate or party, the church can and should argue in favor of legislation that is supportive of our teaching mission and our Catholic values. Here in Columbus, we've begun an initiative um, that we call our Legislative Action Network. Our government affairs director manages this. And really what it is, is just a coalition and network of parents who, um, most of whom are, are representatives of their school's advisory board. And they meet 
periodically, once a month, sometimes more, if we have issues going on. And in those meetings, we share information. We share action steps. We share calls for action, um, templates for letter writing letters, um, requests for parent testimony on various issues. Parent members then relay that information back to their school community. They really act as a grassroots initiative to raise awareness, build engagement, and get our Catholic schools voice heard at our state house. Greater mobilization for Catholic schools nationally could also be done following a similar model. And the USCCD and NCEA currently do a great job getting out there and, and letting our voice be heard. The importance of that cannot be understated. And that's wonderful, thinking a little bit about how we mobilize, right? How do we help in educate and get individuals to support the different um, policies that might be influencing our Catholic schools? And this comes back to that concept of coalition building, right? How do we forge those bonds with other people who have similar values that are striving for the similar kind of positioning and resources and so that we can kind of build up a movement? And so coalition building is really key, right? Catholic schools are not the only private schools that are also trying to access some of these resources. So diocesan offices, often through the Catholic Conference, really should seek to build and connect to other coalitions and other non-public schools. So your Christian schools, Jewish schools, Lutheran schools, independent schools, right? Kind of, it's beautiful when I do see individuals kind of reaching out and engaging with uh, leaders in kind of all private sector types of schools, regardless of the denomination. So it's wonderful to see that movement happening. Learn who, who those influencers are in those different um, institutions, and then think a little bit about joining their own mailing lists, kind of becoming aware of what they're working on, how you can support their efforts is really key. And finally, principals, superintendents, all of us engaged in Catholic school leadership need to ask questions. Politics can be complicated, it's dynamic, it's constantly shifting, constantly changing, but it's part of our jobs. We've got to come to accept that, yes, the principal job continues to grow, and this is a new aspect of it. Our kids deserve it, and by engaging in the political process, by engaging with information and knowledge, we can do amazing things for Catholic schools. So thank you for joining Adam and I. We are grateful for your time today. And if you have any questions or want to get in touch with either of us, we provide our email information here and we hope you enjoy the rest of this NCA on demand and in-person conference. Thank you so very much for all that you do for Catholic schools. We're so grateful to be uh, accompanying you in this important ministry. God bless.